This is the Art of Darkness podcast with Kevin Kautzman and Brad Kelly. We're a couple of very online writers interested in the dark side of what drives creative people to create against all odds. This show is about art and the people who make it, what it costs them, and what it takes to bring something unique and impactful into the world. Each episode, we excavate the life and work of an artist you might think you know. Don't worry, they're all safely dead. On every episode, we try and find out just what the hell was wrong with them and how they worked through their darkness to create something that lives on after them and continues to move culture. Find us online at artofdarkpod.com and on Twitter at Kevin Kautzman and at Brad Kelly. All right, Art of Darkness. Brad, how are you? Doing pretty well. Kevin, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing super. We are... uh, yeah, back with another fun-filled episode. Back with another. I was finding myself getting a little itchy to do it even before ah. I was actually ready. So, All right. yeah, this is good, man. I feel like uh, go where your enthusiasm takes you. So let's let's knock this puppy out. I mean, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's the importance of giving yourself homework. <laughs> yeah, Dude. that's a good point. That's a good point, man, because, mm-hmm. yeah, you, we haven't had a school night in a year, but uh, right. trying to get ahead, you yep. should be doing your homework anyway. So. Netflix and no chill. Yeah, Zero yeah, chill here yeah. uh, in the Art of Darkness uh, house. That's so right. what are we What are we talking about today? Which artist are we talking about today? Dead, uh, dead correct? Dead. Yes, dead, dead okay. since, uh, well, we'll find out when she died. But mm. uh, Anna Kavan. Um, Anna Kavan. Yeah, and, and it, she's a little, unlike uh, William S. Burroughs and Oscar Wilde, our previous episodes and, and probably a, a good majority of our upcoming episodes, She's a little lesser known. Um, She's sort of getting her, she's sort of getting her attention now, it seems like. Um, um, I stumbled upon her book because I love New York Review of Books. I don't know if you're familiar with that publisher. Sure, Uh, sure. um, They had put out a, they had put out a, a, a reissue of a collection of short stories of hers and I just bought it on the title alone and Hmm. was, fell in love with it. It's called Machines in the Head which <laughs> machines in the head, right? Like, I like that. Yeah. If you're yeah. reading, if you're scanning like 20, 30 titles and you see that one, you're like, huh, what is, what is that about? You find out it's written in, you know, it's written in the forties and fifties. It's very, it's very compelling right off the mm. bat. And then she was also mentioned in, um, there's a recent, uh, Netflix exclusive, um, with, oh, geez, I'm going to embarrass myself. The guy who wrote and directed, Ad, uh, the guy who wrote Adaptation and directed Synecdoche, New York. Oh, right, of course. Uh, uh, oh, my God. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Kaufman. His Andy, new film, Andy Kaufman. Andy Kaufman. Not Andy. Or is it not Andy? Andy's the man in the moon guy. <laughs> Donald? <laughs> uh, Why can't I remember this? Being John Malkovich, the great, he's a great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very famous uh, screenwriter. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me um, look it up here. Yeah, he wrote he had his recent film uh Charlie Charlie Kaufman. Charlie Kaufman. That's okay. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. much much respect Andy to Charlie Kaufman, Kaufman who I, right. I I love everything that guy does yeah. and uh his recent film um I'm thinking of ending things is no exception. And Anna Kavan's Ice, which we'll talk about, gets a shout out in that film as well. So okay. All right. um so she's kind of getting her due now it feels like, you know, 40 some 50 some years later. So. I just I just love knowing uh of writers who pour their heart and their soul and their mental illness and their craziness into their writing and then only get recognized after they've died. <laughs> I just, the universe is so sensible and reasonable. Yeah. There's something, you know, as a writer, there's something, you know, who as a writer who hasn't had a tremendous amount of success, there's something bittersweet about that when you mm. come across it in somebody else, there's this glimmer of hope. Like it could, it could always happen. Right. Right. And then there's also this like, yeah, man, but it might happen after you'll after be it matters. dead. Right. <laughs> right. Great. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, hey. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, let's let's get into it. So I'm going to assume, you know, our typical question is asking you what you know about her. I, I, I think you probably don't know a whole heck of a lot about this mm. category. Not a whole lot. I'm yeah. afraid I've barely okay. looked at it. And yeah. uh, so I'm enthusiastic okay. to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit. She's um. Uh, this is a dark one too. So, so we'll try to, we'll try to have fun with it without poking fun. Um, uh, I want to give of you dark dot com. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> what, what else can you say? So right. I'm going to occasionally try to sprinkle in little bits of her writing just to kind of set some tones and show you where she's going and, and that a little bit. 
Um, but one, I just want to, uh, she has a, she had a book of short stories. She was, uh, she wrote novels, but she was also wrote a number of short stories, um, collected in, I think four or five different volumes throughout the years. Um, and I just almost picked this kind of randomly just to give you a vibe. This is from the story. I am Lazarus. There is, I believe a kind of telepathy between the condemned, a sort of intuitive recognition, which can even make itself felt through the medium of the printed page. How else should I feel without fear of appearing presumptuous either for this great man whom I never saw and to whom I could not have spoken, the tender, wincing, pathetic solicitude that painfully comes into being only between fellow sufferers. Oof. So Anna Kavan, the world weighs very heavily on the shoulders of Anna Kavan. And we'll start with the fact that her name wasn't even Anna Kavan. So she was born Helen Woods in 1901. Um, she would publish her first six, six novels as um, Helen Ferguson, which was her, um, which was her, uh, the name she took from her husband. I almost said, uh, <laughs> did, you, did you ever get into Trailer Park Boys, Kevin? I never did. People, okay. people tell me about it. Yeah, no. it's, yeah. it's good, but there's, yeah. there's something in Trailer Park Boys called Rickyisms. Uh -huh. and it's, Ricky's an idiot, and he says dumb things that are hilarious. And one of them is he refers to a woman's name before she was married as her mating name her mating name <laughs> good one <laughs> so yeah. so uh, anna kavan's ma mating name was helen woods born in 1901 um she would you know through her life have multiple names helen woods helen ferguson helen edmonds and finally anna kavan um uh interestingly anna she, kavan has a very nice it's a very nice nom de plume it is it has a right? nice ring yeah, yeah yeah it's got a little mystique to it it's 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 uh ethnically a little bit ambiguous mm, i would mm -hmm, say too mm -hmm. it's not immediately clear where that would come from yeah um she's interesting in that the name and we'll get more into her bio but the name actually is the character in some of her earlier novels that she mm. later adopted for herself and even changed her name to legally so uh, um Kind mm. of just kind of interesting, and this comes as part of her trans late sort of midlife crisis that she has. If this podcast takes off, I will be changing my name to Art. Art, <laughs> Art Darkness, <laughs> Art D Darkness. Yeah. <laughs> so she's born in 1901 in Cannes, um, but she's British. She's the only child of a wealthy British family. Um, they were. It's difficult to find out exactly what they did. There's not as much biographical information about Anna Kavan as there are about some other writers. Mm. Um, but they they were they were both wealthy and a little bit of vagabond. So they bounced all around Europe and even a little bit into America. Um, her mother is. We don't know much about her father. We know that her mother was in at least in Anna Kavan's eyes very controlling, very dictatorial, very sort of uh, dark mother archetype. Mm. Um, her father, so she's born in, in Anna Kavan's born in 1901. Her father in 1911 commits suicide by jumping from a boat. Oh, that's never good. No, that's not. That's bad. <laughs> so, so, and, and then she's left with her mother who, you know, she never has a good relationship with. And we'll, you know, there's two sides to every story, obviously, but this was a, the relationship with her mother was traumatic and would appear in her writing throughout. Um, so in 1920, Anna Kavan's 19, <clears throat> After uh, she had wanted to go to Oxford and apparently had the academics and the wealth to do this, mm. but her mother, her mother interfered and set her up with a man named Donald Ferguson, who was her mother's former lover. So that's Ooh. always good. <laughs> Whoa, we got a little rec recipe for uh, success here. Right. Yeah, How to make an artist. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, you just, fun. Yeah, you. Mm -hmm. So, um, not long after they got married, he took a position on the railroad in Burma. So they go to Burma, Burma, or I'm not, am I supposed to call it Myanmar? Do you know? I think it's now exact? called Myanmar, but at the time it was so. called Burma. At the time it Burma. was definitely called Burma. Yeah. yeah. So um, they, she went there with, went to Burma with him, but within three years, she basically went back to Europe. She left him um, and brought their son, Brian, with him. So she had a child very early She's, 20s. Her mother set her up with one of her own lovers yes what yes. on earth and i just that anecdote you know you hear you read in the literature about her that her mother was this very controlling very kind of obsessive you know person just that alone plants this seed of 
what is her deal, right? Good. Yeah. Ness. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So at this point, she begins, um, when she moves back to Europe, she's in her early 20s. This is when she begins writing. Um, and her first co- book comes out in 1929. So she's pretty young, right? She's 28 years old. It's pretty young on the scene to be publishing a novel. Mm. Um, and I'm going to give you a description of it because she starts, when Annika Kavan's career starts, she's writing very conventional novels. They're not, there's nothing particularly innovative about them, though they do... By all accounts, they are expertly crafted. She's very talented, but she's not particularly breaking any boundaries or anything. <clears throat> um, this first novel, 1929, Charm Circle. Um, reading a little bit of the summary here. <clears throat> um, a, charm for sh- a Charm Circle foreshadows Kavan's later development. It is the story of a family marooned in a country house near an ugly, expanding manufacturing town of the 1920s. The atmosphere of the house is heavy with repression, hostility, and revolt, and is darkened by the sinister influence of the father, whose warped nature dominates the lives of his wife's daughter and son. Um, The struggles of the young people to escape from this malign environment, their desperate search for self-expression and freedom, and their apparent successes point only to the inevitable triumph of temperament and upbringing and leave them enclosed in the charmed, charmed circle of their limitations. So... You know, it's not a cheery novel by any stretch. Um, <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> um, and it, it didn't do particularly well. I mean, it was published, and that's that's a certain kind of success. But, um, you know, it didn't kind of really go anywhere from there. Um, but she was quite prolific. Um, you see here, she's oh, she starts out right out of the gate with this dark outlook, right? People trapped, um, people under control, alienation, that sort of thing. Right, right. Um, so she's in London um, with her son Brian, single momming it, apparent, uh, by all accounts, which mm. must have been challenging in the 20s. Yeah, no doubt. Um, she started p- studying, and it, 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 she must have had some money, though, f- uh, sure. from her father, from her mother, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, she'd study painting uh, at London school, and she would paint throughout her life. Um, and I, I, on the Art of Darkness Twitter, I posted some of her paintings earlier today. Yeah, I saw that, and they reminded me of another artist. They actually remind me of E.J. Gould's uh, Charcoals, okay. and we might get into E.J. a little bit in the context okay. of uh, the next episode, which is going to be about the great George Ivanovich Gurdjieff. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. Where can people find the uh, the Twitter? It's uh, at Art, Art of Dark Pod, correct? Art of Dark Pod. Yep, that's right. And um, they're they're good. You know, I, I'm not an art critic by any means. Uh, they're good. They seem a little bit repetitive. It seems like a little bit, honestly, of, um, you know, in a film when they go, you know, somebody investigator goes into an asylum and they find, you know, <laughs> the person who's been scrawling. All work and no play. <laughs> yeah, it's, they look a little like that. They're they're a little spooky. They're a little disfigured. Um, you know, there's a little bit, uh, it's a little more Picasso than Van Gogh, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, big dark eyes and, and, and somewhat alienated figures. And, and uh, but, but it, there seems to be some talent there. It's certainly better than I could paint. So um, this was a thing she would eventually actually during her life sell some paintings as well. So it was something that contributed to her livelihood a little bit. Um, she was always a traveler, you know, this was, you know, whether that's uh, habit or, or genetic, when she was living in London, single momming it with her son, Brian, she would bounce down to the French Riviera. That was one of her favorite places to go during this time period. And this is where, among other things, she picked up heroin. So... Whoa, um, we're going for yeah. the trifecta. <laughs> oh, we got a dad who jumped off a boat. Right. We got uh, a mother who uh, right. sets you up with her boyfriend, her ex-boyfriend, right. and now H, horse. Yeah, yeah that'll and do. The, that, mm, that'll, that'll help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Okay. Um, apparently she picked it up from some race car driver she was hanging out with. So room, I, room. I, yeah, I like to picture this scene. French Riviera, 1920s. Yeah. Sure. Race car drivers. Yeah. Like, that's a very, I can almost picture it, but I almost don't have enough context for it. It must She's, have been a. She, this money that clearly the money is just there. Yeah. <laughs> Do you yeah. know? It's like, ah. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, that's a thing, right? Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh. So she, um, she, in, um, I don't know if it was in the French Riviera or, or London, doesn't quite matter. She meets her, um, her next husband, this guy named Stuart Edmonds. 
who's an artist, but is generally regarded in everything you read as a total lazy ass. So, you know, he's probably one of these sort of like, you know, dudes, he probably had some money of his own. He, he might have hooked up with her because she had money. You know, who knows what was going on there? But mm -hmm. he was not particularly ambitious. Um, and, uh, you know, so the money was probably a factor. But if you look at photos and images of Anna Kavan, she certainly has some appeal. She was an attractive woman. Mm. Um, and she was also clearly pretty free spirited. So you can imagine 1920s, not to say it was particularly repressive at that time, but she would be some, something that would turn some heads. I would think, you know, hang out so, with race car drivers, published a novel, like, you know, right. All this stuff. Right. Family so, money, quite a right, story. Yeah. Right. Good looking heroin. Yeah. yeah. She's kind of, was she a blonde? She's kind of a blonde. Oh, kind of a she became preface. a blonde. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so we'll I talk see. about, okay. we'll talk about her becoming a blonde, but okay. she all right. was dark haired in the early days. So, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't take very long. Um, and, 1928 she and uh she and edmund's divorce um does so not not too long i don't know actually when they got married but so we're talking about some five six year span um now um this is uh oh i have a little bit about just her writing history because she was i i was impressed by how prolific she was despite her lifestyle being doing the single mom thing and all of this um her first novel comes out in 1929 and she publishes five more novels over the course of the next eight years, which is a pretty impressive resume, really. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, when you're, you're gradually becoming a heroin addict and um, you're a bit of a world traveler. So um, just to give you a sense of some of these books, they're all kind of dark, but she's still, we're talking the late 20s, early 30s. She still is not Anna Kavan. She's mm. still Helen. And her work is fairly conventional, um, at least in terms of, you know, they're continuous and the story starts in one place and it ends in, a, and ends in another place and it makes sense all the way through. So she had a book, um, one of the earlier books was called The Dark Sisters, uh, set in London of the 20s and, um, you know, right after the First World War. Um, this one was kind of a feminist, a feminist deal. <laughs> you know, the general consensus is about f um, female emancipation and general social upheaval. Um, these two sisters live an independent metropolitan life, much like Anna Kavan. Um, Emerald is successful, but, ma ma but manipulative. Her younger sister is unmotivated and content to live in a fantasy world of her own making. So they, you know, try to set them up with a man. And there's like vague Jane Austen implications here, but darker and more modern for sure. Um, 1935, she publishes a novel called uh, A Stranger Still. Um, this is about a wealthy family which she knows about apparently um right william a, widow, a widower presides forcefully over his empire of greater london stores as well as over his sons so again we have the dictatorial parent in uh -huh. this case it's the father but not the mother um you know her father might have been that way too we don't really know um this is the book a stranger still in 1935 where the fictional anna kavan first shows up um she's a young girl in this novel adrift from her husband and now in pursuit of romantic fulfillment um, and it's a it's a story that bounces all over Europe, Bohemian, London, Paris, south of France and Italy. So, you know, this is this is she's starting to put her life even more into these into this work. Right. Um, get one more here. There's another book called Rich Get Rich comes out in 1937. Uh, it's about a young man trying to exp escape the painful ra realities of life through wealth, right? So, right. again, fairly conventional kind of stuff. I haven't read any of those. They're probably, based on the stuff I have read of her, they're probably very solid. You know, she's well-educated. She's smart as a whip um, and clearly, you know, a worker when it comes to writing. So I imagine that they're... They're probably pretty interesting. If you want to read, you know, 1930s uh, literature written by a woman in Europe who's sort of undergoing like um, uh, first wave, I guess, is this first wave feminism in 1930? I that... think we're talking about it. Yeah, we're talking yeah. about suffrage and yeah, I mean, right. she was I mean, born it's happening. And yeah. When she was born, women couldn't vote in America. I don't actually know the history of women's suffrage in Europe, um, but certainly, certainly a topic. Um, 
but through all these you're getting through all of these novels you're getting her notions and her clear interests that run throughout her work feminism uh society particularly sort of the trap of wealthy society um, um but we're still helen ferguson at this point and we're waiting for something to happen in her life as it's, it's, reading through her biography there is a there is a hard switch to when she becomes Anna Kavan. Okay. Um, what uh, happens? Bowie is... becomes uh, Ziggy Stardust. It's <laughs> yes. we're, it's close. It's happening. Yeah, it's, we're it's almost very, there. It's it's we're almost there. So, um, will uh, 1930s? Okay, Kavan and Ed Edmonds um, married. They have a daughter who dies in infancy. Oh. Right. So yeah. this is, you talked about the trifecta. This is the quartifecta or whatever. Yeah. Or whatever yeah. Right? So quickly the marriage falls apart. Um, Kavan makes a number of suicide attempts, which oh would my then God. become a normal sort of thing throughout her life. Oh, um, no. mm. um, her mother actually sends her to an asylum in Switzerland. Um, mm. And she's there for an undetermined amount of time um, in the late 30s. And then when she emerges, she's her hair is dyed blonde. She's calling herself Anna Kavan, and her writing is totally changed. Huh. Um, so it's not clear what happened in that asylum necessarily. I don't know if it was too early for electroshock therapy. Um, it's or that cuckoo what. clock on the wall, that yeah. Swiss uh, air mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so now she's 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 you know she's going to change her name legally to Anna Kavan, and everything she writes after this point is going to be under that name. Um, in 1940, um, so I might have screwed the time up a little bit, timeline up a little bit. 1938, she comes out of the asylum. 1940, she publishes a, a work called Asylum Piece that is all short stories. Um, um, it's kind of, it's been described as a psychological exploration of various forms of insanity. And people who, people who've written about it said it seemed like she knew about this firsthand. So, um, so yeah, so she goes through this process. Obviously, there's still some money involved, but she's lost her daughter. She's now lost her second husband, um, yes. even though the first one was a setup and she probably wasn't too sad about that. Um, now we're getting into World War II. So right. now not only, not, and, and World War II, you weren't there and I, I wasn't there. World War II in Europe had to be a different vibe than World War II in America. Oh, yeah. Right? Because the, the bombs are falling. The For stuff sure. is happening in, you know, your neighborhood almost. Well, and it continues to influence our character, right? Americans mm -hmm. are extremely paranoid, uh, but the, the, all of Europe actually suffered under it. Right, right, yeah. right, right. So she's living in this time, and she decides, unlike probably everyone else in the world, that she is just going to start bouncing around planet Earth. She just travels. Wow. And... She travels to um, New Zealand. She travels to America, both California, both California and New York. She travels to Indonesia. She travels all over parts of Europe she can get to and everywhere in between. Um, and this route becomes very, um, excuse me, becomes very complicated because you can't just go anywhere. And your plans are, are basically tentative at best, right? You buy a ticket and, you know, next thing, maybe that city is... Maybe the boat gets, gets hit by a submarine. Right, right. <laughs> Any so number very, of things can happen, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this wasn't necessarily just like a pleasure cruise the whole time, though I'm right. sure it was sometimes. Um, so she travels, and she travels for a, quite a few years. She's in New Zealand, I believe, for up to a year, actually. Mm, right. um, just kind of hangs out there. She, But she's writing all this time. She has a number of publications between 1940 and 1947, including a book that, when it's published in America, is called The House of Sleep, which, <laughs> <laughs> which is... You've, uh, you've also uh, <laughs> written a novel called House of Sleep, correct? Right, yeah. And, and this, the, I titled it long before I... Actually, I didn't even know this book existed until I started re researching for this podcast. So that was like a cool... Cool. Uh, Fun. Yeah, I got a book out there called House of Sleep. You should there buy you it. Go. If you're, Brad if you're, Kelly. If you're into books. At Brad Kelly on Twitter. That's me. That's me. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So as the traveling is sort of winding down, but she apparently is still doing this, 1944, we have to remember that she had a son with her first husband, Brian. 1944, Brian is like 21 or so. 
Brian is killed in action in World War II. Uh, right. So she had uh, her, her daughter. Her daughter died in infancy. Uh, Brian's killed in World War II. The rich um, are not like us, and yet they suffer. There, there oh, can yeah. be a tremendous amount of, obviously it goes without saying, but my goodness, I mean, this, yeah. this woman is, uh, that's a lot to That's a, to that's a lot you just, for you anyone. Just those bullet, bullet, bullet listed items, that's, yeah. that's hard. That's, yeah. a tough, that's a tough life. And yeah. I don't know, no amount of money really solves no, that. No amount of yeah. money will, will solve that. Although, of course, you, know, you take the money over not having it. Well, but. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get yeah. your heroin prescription. You're okay. You're just go off there. Right, the right. Well, we'll get it, we're going to get into that, okay. too, because right. heroin was a totally different thing in her time than mm. it is in our time, right? Ooh. Just societally, right? Ah. So, um, so, okay, so she comes back. It's 1944, mid, 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 uh, mid to late 40s. Um, she's back in the UK, and she pretty much would stay there for the rest of her life, barring occasional trips here and there. Um, she took a secretarial position at this literary magazine called Horizon. She would publish there as well. Um, she has a number of – she wrote a lot of book reviews. Um, seems like a kind of standard book reviewer. I think she was pretty much just doing it to get paid, more or less. See, now this kind of surprises me uh, because I'm, I'm painting a picture in my mind right now of somebody who's extremely bohemian and probably mm-hmm. couldn't hold a job down, but now it sounds like maybe she's not quite as, as much a uh, yeah, well, wild well, woman as well, that. This is weird. I think she was wilder. I think she traveled hard and was into heroin, and there's intimations that she tried every basically every drug that came her way. Um and then I think, you know, so she, it, it's, it's like she, the death of her daughter in infancy, like broke something and sent her scattering to the winds. And there's not much written about what that was like for her, though she wrote about it somewhat. And I have to imagine, this is what I imagine it being like for her as I read her later work. Most of the stuff I've written comes from after Brian dies. Um, I think she f- like responded to her daughter dying by by basically embracing the fullness of what she could get away with in life traveling and mm-hmm. fucking, you know there's mm-hmm. a war going on i don't care like right and then brian dies and it's sort of like you can't escape the world like mm. there's nothing you can do you're trapped here these things are happening happening basically randomly there's no choice you know well then um, there may have been a a simple tactic i'm getting away from the war those right. traveling well, years. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty sensible. You go spend. Right. I read. I read real quick. It was like twenty-two months in New Zealand. That's a okay, pretty good yeah. place to weather the. Yeah. You know, World War Two. For sure. Yeah. yeah for sure. You so it might have been a bit. It might have been a bit of that too. But she definitely mm-hmm. was, you know, a bit more free spirited than we imagine. Oh, a no pers- doubt. A, a woman, particularly um, sure. in that time period. But you're right. She was able to hold down a job, and she actually. So while she was working for this Horizon, she also apparently was had a sideline as a property developer. Um, and she bred bulldogs. So, okay. All right. so she, you know, she had a number of side hustles apparently and, and sold paintings as well. So, um, you know, it, it, it's never really mentioned in the material I've read how much money she was getting from, you know, her father's estate or whatever, but apparently she wasn't, um, she was never quite destitute at any point in her life. Um, and I feel like if you're, you know, trying to hustle as a property developer you probably you probably need the money a little bit but i could be wrong yeah i mean it could have been that somebody tapped her on the shoulder and said hey this is a good place to put your money that could and be yeah usually yeah. is yeah. yeah yeah so she um not too long after this this there's multiple returns to U- the uk but this is sort of the the final one where you know she she dies in notting hill and and the, the, pretty much the rest of her life is spent in London after Brian dies. Um, she begins treatment. Um, you know, we've got somebody who's been into heroin, um, who's had two children die, um, who, uh, you know, has a troubled, who's had her father commit suicide, has had a troubled relationship with her parents or her mother, mm. um, and has had multiple suicide attempts. Um, and spent time in an asylum. She seeks treatment from this German psychiatrist named Carl Theodore Bluth. Um, and this relationship with Bluth, they would become not only friends, um, but creative collaborators, which is odd to me. And um, Bluth would, until his death, be her pipeline for heroin, essentially. 
Um, ah, fun. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and at this time, you know, the good doctor, right. And she was already, it's not clear what the extent of her addiction was, but she was already, you know, he didn't introduce her to heroin. Right. Um, but I think there was, there was a moment in some of the stuff I read where, you know, they started working together and he's, he basically said, well, it seems like it's good for you. <laughs> Like, basically, she's writing, right? She's got these careers. Her kid's dying. That wasn't her fault. You know, she's got this nervous temperament or whatever that's caused or neurotic temperament that's causing her to He was like, yeah, this seems this seems like a good solution. So he pretty much hooks her up with heroin for the next 20 odd years. Um, um, in this time, too, she's I'll oh, go ahead. I, I, you know, uh, drugs are a fascinating subject, and I don't think that there's going to be a single artist we touch on who doesn't have some kind of a, of a relationship with some kind of a drug. It's just part of our human reality. And I didn't think so. Yeah, I mean, maybe I mean, we'll find someone who's just completely straight edge, and it, and it never comes up. But it just seems to be a fixture or a feature of of our lives one way or another and your relationship, the drug you choose, what's yeah. your poison at all. It's all kind of there. It's very interesting. It, it very much is. And I want to actually take a little sideline and talk because, and, I, and the only reason I want to do this is because two, and they built my choices. So uh, where, where's my head at? But um, <laughs> it's just two of our people so far have had a relationship with heroin. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, but before I even get there, the thing you mentioned, it's like every artist, as I was doing research on this, I somehow came across the fact that of all musicians that I never would have thought about this with, James Taylor was a heroin addict. Huh. Right? Just wow. like, to us, he's like the sweetest, like, coffee shop kind of, like, your mom and dad listen to James yeah. Taylor. You know, yeah. like, <laughs> sweet dreams and flying machines. Like, sure, sure. He apparently, yeah. So, hey, look, I... One of the things I say is the moral of the story, kids, is always don't take heroin. And I really kind of believe that. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I agree. But yeah. it seems to work for some people, too. So I, I try not to be a judgy person. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Anna Kavan lived with it for quite a long time, but not everybody does. So yeah. Yeah, All right, I, I couldn't. I couldn't recommend it. But, I think. Um, I think especially now because there's so much fentanyl mixed in and stuff. Mm -hmm. I just think now is probably not a good time to pick up a habit. Yeah. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So let me. Let me. So let's just talk about the history of heroin for five minutes because it's kind of interesting. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and this is absolutely why you start a podcast like right. this. let's just pause and talk about heroin for yeah five minutes. We, it's why not man hey it's a it's, it's a sunday uh, night yeah yeah um so first synthesized in 1874 uh by an english chemist so they already had morphine at this time but they were looking for ways to make it more effective and less addictive um right. So they would basically, in chemistry at that time, was pretty rough. You would just sort of like mix stuff and write down the results <laughs> compared, to, compared to now. So this chemist was just like, and I don't know the full story behind this, but he was apparently just mixing morphine with different acids. And then I, I had to wonder, like, well, how would you know whether it had the results you wanted? Yeah. Wouldn't you have to take it? Like, right. What else would there be to do? Uh, uh, know, maybe so. maybe animal testing of some sort. Uh, yeah, I guess you could and like measure measure heart yeah, rate. Yeah, I guess you something. just shoot up a little mouse and then give it a guitar and see how it sounds. <laughs> see how it sounds. It just invents <laughs> grunt or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, no, we're on to something here. Ma my mouse starts just playing Purple Haze. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it kind of nothing really happened with it. So it was 23 years later, and a chemist working at Bayer. Um, who, you know, later Bayer, I don't think is a company anymore, is it? Uh, but, it's a German uh, company. I know it that is. They invented, yeah. a, they invented aspirin. Mm -hmm. um, the company branded it uh, heroin. So heroin was its brand name for people mm -hmm. who don't know, because it means strong and heroic. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So, All right. Huh. um, um, Anyway, remember the idea of this was to have a drug that was less addictive than morphine. So Bayer starts selling this. It's it's effectively over the counter at first, um, and eventually, <laughs> right? It's a party party time. on. Yeah. So eventually, you know, eventually people realize that it's a problem. Mm. Um, 
in nineteen addictive and people are yeah yeah, yeah it's not overdosing it's not, and, right 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 overdose and addiction are, are the big things um and probably there was probably a little protestant work ethic pushback there too you know right doesn't you can go out and get hammered and get up and push through the day but yeah. we're reaching a point here you know you're shooting up yeah. first thing in the morning maybe you're right. not as productive at the stamp factory or whatever right. you do <laughs> right right so in 1914 there's the harrison narcotics act and this is this is where you start to get regulations though you can still get it um apparently sh- either in 1914 or shortly thereafter in new york city alone there were as many as 200,000 heroin addicts who oh. Which is way more than I would have thought. Wow. I thought you were talking about a small group of, you know, hmm. sort of fringe thing. But 200,000 in New York City, even now, that's not insignificant, really. No, so, I mean, right. That's a, that's a sizable number of people. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. I did not know this. Yeah. So, yeah. so you had some issues. And <laughs> um, you could still get it in prescription, though, at least in the United States until 1924. And that's when Congress banned sale, importation, and manufacture. Um, regulations throughout the world were like spotty and, mm. and the, the progression of them was slower and things happened at different times. Um, so for most of her life, um, Kavan was actually able to procure heroin totally legally. Right. Um, one th- other thing, and then we'll move on. We'll move off this. We already kind of talked about the relationship it has to art, and I don't think there's much new to say there in terms of the historical significance of you know people who use heroin in their contributions to music and things like that. Um, but one thing that was interesting is uh, Bayer apparently lost the trademark rights to heroin as part of the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I, who bothered to like make that that tells you so but that's what it's all about baby yeah it yeah. is it is you are fighting and dying you're garroting krauts in the <laughs> in the trenches so that pharmaceutical companies can patents change hands that's what it's all about baby. yeah right yeah. that was a bizarre well they, the oh, what an house. example of how the germans got you know hosed at the end of mm. world war one and how that came back to bite the entire world uh, sure years yeah later. yeah they, so just, i think they world war ii was they were trying to get those trademark rights back. oh yeah, right i mean yeah you, you took the heroin <laughs> from us it, it's uh, it's heroic and strong <laughs> We need it back. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> okay, so, that's good to know. Yeah. So um, anyway, so, you know, uh, Kavan's publishing all this time living in the UK through the 50s. She starts to slow down as, you know, anybody would, especially if you're, you know, sticking a needle in your arm. Um, one thing that's worth noting, too, this is an interesting sort of sidebar in her life. So she's working with this doctor, um, Carl Theodore uh, Bluth. Um, one thing that he was able to do for her is he got her into sanatorium Bellevue, which apparently is this like famous psychiatric yeah. hospital. Bellevue, you would just immediately associate that with. Yeah. You know, so there's a, there's a New York yeah. Bellevue as uh, well, but this is, um, I think it was Swiss actually. London. Write it down. Bellevue hospital. Santa, uh, sanatorium. Sanitarium. Santa, yeah. Sanitarium. Yeah, interesting. Okay, yeah. So, so she, while she was there, she was treated by this other famous um, psychiatrist named Ludwig Binswanger. Uh, that's probably not exactly how you pronounce Binswanger, but mm-hmm. uh, he's a pretty interesting guy. He's a, he had been a student of Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud, and he's known as a pioneer in the field of existential psychology. So, you know, this guy was a kind of a trip in his own right. It's where you like wear a beret and you smoke and you kind of vaguely complain about things at a cafe. (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. Charge people. Right. And charge people lots of money for it. Uh, Um, Life is pain. Yeah. One thing, one thing. Okay. So I was looking, I kind of got into a little bit of a rabbit hole on this Ben Swanger guy. Um, just because this notion of existential psychology was pretty interesting. You know, he's taking some of the, he was a psychiatrist, so he's taking some of the knowledge from that, but he's, you know, borrowing from Freud and borrowing from Jung. He wrote a book called Dream and Existence. Um, And, uh, you know, so he, in this book, he says that the necessity, he talks about the necessity of quote unquote, quote, Steeping oneself in the manifest content of the dream, which, since Fred's epoch-making postulate concerning the reconstruction of latent thoughts, has in modern times receded all too far into the background. So I wonder, 
I don't know how good Bin Swanger would have been for Annika Vaughn's mental health, but I think <laughs> I think he may have been somewhat good for her art because what you see her doing in the later work is she's looking for ways to um, come up with um, objective correlates for her own internal suffering and pain. She's trying to create a sort of architecture a narrative architecture out in outside of her that can represent everything that's going on with her. So she's a coextensive with this stuff that she's creating. And um, it, that just ramps up as her work goes on. You can kind of see her chasing after some sort of, I don't want to necessarily call it therapeutic, but she's trying to exorcise something. And, and is her work at this point, is it becoming increasingly experimental and, and unusual? Yes. Okay. Yes. She's going deeper and deeper into, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Nonlinear. Absolutely. Okay. Right. So it's becoming nonlinear is a big thing. And so she's, 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 and, and some of it is almost non-narrative to a certain extent. Um, like, let me read you a little bit from, um, <laughs> uh, I'll read you a little bit from uh, this book called, uh, this is actually, so the house of sleep was called sleep has his house in Europe when it was published in Europe. So this is from that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Are you afraid of the tigers? Do you hear them paddling all around you on their fierce, fine velvet feet? The speed of growth of tigers in the nightland is a thing which ought to be investigated sometime by the competent authority. You start off with one about the size of a mouse. And before you know, when you are, you, before you know where you are, he's twice the size of the Sumatra tiger, which defeats all comers in that hemisphere. And then before you can say knife, not a very tactful thing to say in the circumstances, all his boy and girlfriends are gathered around your respectable, quiet, decorous, docile night turns itself into a regular tiger garden. And wow, that is what a great like, paragraph. Right? It's just this like flight of fancy. There's no actual tigers in the novel, right? So she's, she's, she's occupying these kind of strange spaces where she, she can kind of go into this sort of stuff. And I want to read a little bit from this short story called our city. If I can find it here, go ahead. And, and while you look, uh, is there a tome from her that is kind of the go-to, right? So for yeah. Burroughs, it would be naked lunch. What is the one? Uh, for Kavon? It's either Mach machines in the head or her final novel ice, which we're okay. going to, which we're going to talk about. So um, let me just give you, a quick this isn't even necessarily a story so um she's got this story called our city um and she's talking about this city and she says it's three different things so i'm going to read the, her description of it the third thing that it is no i can't explain how our city can be at one time a judge at another a trap and at another an octopus nor i have any way of elucidating the sentence passed on me which is really two sentences mutually exclusive but running concurrently the sentence of banishment from the city and of imprisonment in it. You may wonder how I have the heart to keep on at all in such a hopeless position. Indeed, there are often times when I'm practically in despair, when the contradiction seems, contradiction seems too bitter and senseless and incomprehensible to be, to be born. All that keeps me going, then, I think, is the hope that some time or other I may chance upon the solution, that one half of the contradiction will somehow dissolve into the other, or the sentence as a whole be modified or even remitted, it is no good approaching these obscure matters systematically. All one can do is go on living, if possible, and move a little, tentatively, as occasion offers, first in one direction and then in another. Like that, a solution may ultimately be found, as in the case of those puzzles made of wires inter intertwined, which suddenly, and by a purely accidental manipulation, fall apart into two halves. Hmm. So, yes, yeah, she's got these stories, and a lot of them are, I mean, we're all familiar with uh, Kafka's The Trial, a lot of these feel like um, they could be set in the same world in which the trial happens. You know, side stories. This is what happens to Kay's neighbor or something like that. They have that vibe of this trap, this bureaucracy, this senselessness, um, the world being somewhat unintelligible and you kind of just live in a way in which you're hoping it will, it, the, the ball will bounce your way at some point. Um, that seems to be the general vibe of a lot of, of mm. a lot of her, especially her short work. Um, so kind of moving on, um, talked about Bluth. Um, we talked about her work at this time. It's getting kind of stranger and stranger. Um, 1964, 
um, her doctor who'd been providing her with all that fine H dies and uh, it's not good. Uh, <laughs> and the thing is that she wasn't only, he wasn't only the guy who provided her with heroin. They were friends and it's possible as her life became more reclusive that n- this was the person who was closest to him, to her. Right. And so hmm. it was hard. This was another difficult, another difficulty. Um, there's m- there's a number of suicide attempts at this time. Oh. Um, and, uh, you know, she says that uh, in talking about these suicide attempts at this time, she said she was not this uh, interview or, or sorry, a profile in the Paris Review says that she was not grateful to the friends who saved her. She, she had actually said, I can't say how profoundly I resent their interference. So, you know, and this is in this 1964, she's 63 years old. It's been kind of a long life of suffering for the most part. Um, but in 1967, <clears throat> um, her novel Ice comes out. Um, and Ice is the closest in her life she ever got to something like success. She was profiled in... Right, um, I was... Uh, just hang on one second. Yeah. I was going to say, what are these books doing out in the world right. at this point? This, this right. woman who's a heroin addict, she comes mm-hmm. from, from money, writing mm-hmm. kind of Kafka-esque experimental fiction. Mm-hmm. Can't imagine these are, these are uh, bestsellers, right? These are, they're no, real. Yeah, no. they're really not. We're not talking... And when I say Ice was successful, we're not talking Jonathan Franzen on the cover of Time Successful. Right. You know, we're talking, you know, she was in a magazine, she was in a few magazines, interviews in a few magazines and that sort of thing. Hey, um, you take what you can get. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's 1967 and it's, it's a, there's a lot of attempts to call it science fiction and I don't think any of them actually stick. Um, mm-hmm. It's, it's, they try to, I think it's tried to call science fiction just in the same way that we, we always want to categorize everything. Um, but the only, the only thing that's science fiction about it is that in the book, the world is clearly ending. Um, it's not clear. It's clear that it's ending, but nobody really knows why or how. Um, it's political chaos is sort of just sweeping the world. And there is a gradual like incrustation of ice. It's sort of like another ice age is coming, but there's also some more fantastical aspects of it. It seems to be like the ice is actually growing to cover the earth. Um, but it's not, if it were science fiction, so the way I think about science fiction, and tell me if I'm wrong, and if something is quote unquote science fiction, to me, that means everything that happens in it, even as far out as it could be, has a rational explanation. Mm. Like, you know, they're aliens. So the, the reason that they're like that is because in the world I, that they I, developed, it's like that. Right, I see. I, that, yeah. I think that's an okay theory of science fiction. Yeah. I'm sure Very, we could go down some Reddit sure. rabbit hole about yeah. exceptions to that. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah. And it's very general. And I don't mean sure. that as a knock either. No, no, like, no. You know, uh, yeah, um, it's just, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just a facet. It's everything kind of has an explanation, even mm. if the explanation is, is pretty far-fetched. It isn't like magical realism where the grandmother uh, sends yeah. you a butterfly in your dream and the next day, you know, yeah, whatever you, you fall in love with a butterfly keeper or whatever, <laughs> right, you know, right, I don't know. Right. <laughs> that, yeah. was, that was terrible. That's <laughs> why I don't write it. that kind of stuff. But you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's yeah, a little yeah. tweet. It, it, hers is n- neither of these things. Right. Mm. So, so against this backdrop of this, this world, like the world being gradually covered in ice and political unrest unfolding, you have, um, something like a love triangle, except one of the legs of the love triangle keeps their identity keeps changing. Um, and the, um, the main character, nobody has names in this frigging book, which I, you know, it's good help. or bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm of the opinion, just like give them a name of some mm. sort. Mm. Um, but whatever. Um, the main character is a, is a man who's, who's trying to find and save this woman called the girl. And, you know, she's a, she's a sort of an archetype. She's impossibly like bird, like thin and, you know, almost white hair, um, sort of almost like this ghostly figure. Mm. And he's following her all of the time. He's, he's always trying to find her. And early on before the world sort of falls into chaos, he actually goes and, 
Um, they had had a romance early on and then he had left for some kind of work or something. Uh, again, all these background details are very vague sort of on purpose and plants you in this sort of dream sequence. But as the world begins to collapse, he's he early on he meets her, he spends some time with her and this man. And then later um, he comes back and visits them there again. And it's gotten very dark and, and it's, it, they were, they were living this sort of romantic lifestyle out in the woods. And when he goes back, it's very dark and there's arguments and yelling and she eventually leaves and he starts chasing her from place to place, always on intuition. He never has any idea where she actually is, but he always finds her. And um, he goes to um, some country that's unnamed on a boat and it's clearly been like bombed out. It's not a place for tourists to go. It'd be like going to Syria or something, right? Like it's not, it doesn't make, you even just go there. Right. Um, but she is there and she's being held by this guy, by the guy who essentially runs this region. Um, and he's trying to figure out ways to get in there. It's this obsessive kind of compulsion. She's but, writing this in her 60s. She's writing this in her 60s. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. so, and, and then... But, the one thing I'm not conveying very well is the discontinuity of everything and po things that are not possible start to ha start to happen. Like he will describe the character will describe things that are happening to her that he's not around for. So there's a hallucinating or a projecting kind of con thing going on, or he's actually seeing this or she's entirely a figment of his imagination. But then the thing is she dies I think I counted, she dies five times in the book. Ah, So she wow. will die in some attempt. He's making some attempt to rescue her. It doesn't work. She dies. Yeah. And then he will go and find her again someplace else, right? And she will be there and he will, you know, and they will, they will play this whole thing out again. Hmm. Um, so it's, so it, it, it's a very, it's a very kind of intense book in that there are, um, there's a lot of sort of mayhem in these political unrests, um, but it's very, the tension and the suspense is very, is very well done. But ultimately it's, it's, it's this sort of dreamlike quality that's achieved in this, when she, the way that she breaks continuity. And there's a very, like, I don't know how familiar you are with Franz Kafka. I don't know that we've, you and I have really ever talked about to it. To a degree. I mean, I like to say that Kafka is a hack. But I'm, it was a hack, but I'm being, I'm being uh, jokey when right. I say that. I You're tend saying to, he didn't go far enough. Right. I'm saying, yeah. uh, you know, Kafka sort of seems to go to this extreme and it's like, yeah. oh, it's so terrible in the office. And now it's like the entire world it's, has caught yes. up and raced yeah. past Kafka. Yeah. That's what yeah. I mean when I say You're right. Kafka of course. was a hack. Of in course. fact, that yeah. might, if we ever make merch, that might yeah. be the first bit of Art of Darkness <laughs> merch. Like It'll that. just say Kafka was a hat. Uh, uh, all right. All right. I'm I think, into that. I think you need to take the Kafka episode, Brad. I think oh. that, that's more your valley work than mine. What do you think? I could do that. I okay. do like I do like Kafka for sure. Mm. Um, okay. Um, so anyway, so one the, a great novel of Kafka's is uh, The Castle. And, I was just going to say that um, ha Michael Haneke directed a version of The Castle. I did not Which know is that. quite interesting. I went really, really deep down a, Kafka, uh, a, a Haneke uh, hole at one point. I somehow missed that entirely. His version of The Castle is so interesting because it ends and it's like, the title at the end, the title card at the end just says, and this is where the novella ends. <laughs> <laughs> there is no way we are not making an effort to right, uh to right. complete the story the end right. and you just go perfect right. chef's, right. chef's kiss love yeah. it yeah yeah so there is a bit of the castle element to, to to ice because part of for a long part of the novel she is trapped by the warden who is the third leg in this love triangle but is the warden is at one point he's this like kind of slobby dude she's living with and at another point later on he's like some kind of re he's like a he's elevated in status so but it's always the same guy in this strange way our main mm. character always relates to him the same way mm. and the, the guy re always relates to him similarly um but there's this castle element where he's like he goes into this labyrinthine like compound to try and find her and it never quite works you know doorways don't go where they're supposed to go and uh -huh. that, that sort of thing uh. um let's see if i can just find we're we're hitting an hour, so I want to just read one little bit of of ice, and then we'll we'll, we'll talk about the the final little bit of uh, Anna Kavan's life. Uh, is that the one I want to read? 
Yeah. All right. This is from early on. So no spoilers, even though I just spoiled the whole novel, basically. <laughs> I don't um, think so. I think, I think if you're going to read ice, you're going to, you're going to get into it. You'll be in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I may do. An unearth, an unearthly whiteness began to bloom on the hedges. I passed a gap and a gap and glanced through for a moment. My lights picked out like searchlights, the girl's naked body slight as a child's ivory white against the dead white of the snow, her hair bright as spun glass. She did not look in any, any direction. Motionless, she kept her eyes fixed on the walls moving slowly toward her, a glassy, glittering circle of solid ice of which she was the center. Dazzling flashes came from the ice cliffs far over her head. Below, the outermost fringes of ice had already reached her, immobilized her, set hard as concrete over her feet and ankles. I watched the ice climb higher, covering knees and thighs, saw her mouth open, a black hole in the white face, heard her thin, agonized scream. I felt no pity for her. On the contrary, I derived an indescribable pleasure from seeing her suffer. I disapproved of my own callousness, but there it was. Various factors had combined to produce it, although they were not extenuating circumstances. So this is early on. I, I kind of forgot that she basically dies there too. So, and he's also, the thing is, he's also, he's obsessed with finding her and saving her. But every time they're together, he basically hates her. So it's this very complicated is relationship. Is she working out her own suicidal ideation here? Is that sort of what the I metaphor think is? So, or because it seems like she's got to be, and maybe I'm just, you know, leaning too much into the gender expectations, but it seems like she's got to be relating more to the girl than to the main character. But Or both. It's it's the death wish and she's trying she's been trying to kill herself since she was young and, and the character dies time and again and mm -hmm. what was her suicide and all of it. Yeah. Right, right. So when, when she would make these attempts, do we know how she was doing it? I, I assume we're not I talking about a shotgun here. We're probably talking about like yeah, pills or I think it was yeah. Hills. There was not, I couldn't really find any. I actually tried to find out more about that and I couldn't, you know, I didn't really say probably yeah. kind of polite society sort of thing. But right. my impression was that it was what it was pills or maybe well, trying to overdose. And, and when you say polite society too, you know, we kind of breeze past this. It looks like she lived, you know, most of her final years on, I read Peel Street mm -hmm. in London. I mean, this is steps away from the palace here i mean this is the, oh is it really? she's in kensington geographically where what that it's meant west yeah. london like the it's okay. one of the nicest places in the world to really? live full stop yeah i mean it's a great area like notting hill so i mean you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. interesting so interesting. she so so 1967 i this book ice is published i i strongly recommend it, it people if you're into hard sci-fi don't go into it expecting that but if you're into anything more in the in the sort of kafka tradition uh if that can be called a tradition i would i would strongly recommend it and also the parts that are are catchy and punchy read like really really well written noir ah right so it's got that vibe to it at times as mm. well um but it also it wanders in and out of that sort of that sort of mode 1967 yeah. it came out 1967 oh, man. 1967. i just ah. <laughs> i ahead. mean we're 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 binge watching mad men again and just mm -hmm. so sort of think like the world of mad men kind of happens or right around this time and mm -hmm. you've got her and i just think about somebody who was born in 1901 yeah. to make it to the late 70s and, oh wild yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so we're kind of coming to the end here so 1967 Ice comes out, her most famous novel. Um, it does, it's published in Europe first. She's profiled in Nova magazine, which was like this edgy, edgy um, feminist magazine. Um, the science fiction writer Brian Aldiss, who I'm not sure if you know, but who's quite famous. He's sort of he's sort of like a notch below Robert Heinlein in terms of how well known he is. Okay. Um, at his urging, it was picked up by an American publisher. And it was published in the United States in 1968, one week after Anna Kavan was dead. Ah. Mm. So <clears throat> Anna Kavan, there, uh, I don't want to like go too much into sort of glorifying it or, or poking fun at it, but she died by herself. She'd been basically a recluse, particularly since the death of her Dr. Bluth. Um, she had been hoarding heroin um, 
because she was afraid with increasing regulations that she wasn't going to be able to get it. And as you can imagine, as you get older, it gets harder to do that kind of thing anyway. You know, just you don't know as many people. You're living a reclusive <laughs> yeah, life. Yeah, you're, you're just going to go over to Soho and like talk to some uh, doorman. And go, hey, yeah, it's kind of. Get me some horse here. Right. You know. it's, right it's hey, sort Sonny. Of, yeah, so she had been so she had been storing it up. It's not clear exactly how she died. It could have possibly been a heroin overdose, though everything I read says heart attack. In fairness, if you are going to hoard anything, hard drugs, I'll allow it. <laughs> I'll allow it. I, you yeah, know, well, you Funko don't know Pops, what you're, no. Yeah. Yeah, no. Uh, no rock pops. candy, no. <laughs> no. Hard drugs, I understand. Okay, okay, Relatable, I get it. I get what acceptable. I get what you're trying to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> this is a scarce commodity. Yeah, right? you I mean, got it, and you. Yeah. Need and then there's it. this whole social dance you have to do right. to get more of the hard right. drugs. Right. So I totally, yeah, so I get it. Fill up a couch cushion <laughs> with it, man. I think, I think yeah. that uh, Hunter uh, started fear and loathing with a pretty good uh, collect. Collect. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, I don't blame you if that's your yeah. plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So she died apparently with a syringe in her arm oh, no. um, mm. and as the police statement said enough heroin in her apartment to kill the entire street Ooh. Ooh. so Jeez. she had been storing it up for quite some time so yeah you know sort of a uh, a sad end for a sad human being um and i want to read one other quick thing from this story that came out after she had passed away came out in 1970 it's called julia and the bazooka and the bazooka <laughs> is a slang term for a syringe actually ah, okay so um she hadn't talked about most of her writing doesn't openly talk about drugs hmm. the ice doesn't mention it almost nothing in the city um machines in the head book is about drugs whatsoever except for the story which came out after she was she had passed away anyway um so a little bit from this, it's kind of an, it's, it's a good piece. It's like six or seven pages, which I, clearly I'm not going to read all through. Um, but uh, here we go. Julia likes the doctor as soon as she meets him. He's understanding and kind like the father she has imagined but never known. He does not want to take her syringe away. He says, you've used it for years already and you're none the worse. In fact, you'd be far worse off without it. He trusts Julia. He knows she is not irresponsible. She does not increase the dosage too much or experiment with new drugs. It is ridiculous to say that all drug addicts are alike, all liars, all vicious, all psychopaths or delinquents just out for kicks. He is sympathetic towards Julia, whose personality has been damaged by no love in childhood so that she can't make contact with people or feel at home in the world. In his opinion, she is quite right to use this syringe. It is essential to her as insulin to a diabetic. Without it, she could not lead a normal existence. Her life would be a shambles, but with its support, she is conscientious and energetic, intelligent, friendly. She is most unlike the popular notion of a drug addict. Nobody could call her vicious. So that kind of summarizes a little bit of her yeah. relationship with it, right? Wow. Needing it like a diabetic needs insulin. And, you know, at the same time, she was prolific. I mean, it's like 12 or 15 books all told, like, that's a pretty impressive resume. It, it, it sounds to me too like she didn't leave a wake of carnage. She didn't right. leave uh, children behind who were right. neglected. She didn't. So, nevertheless, the moral of the story, kids, is don't do heroin. Don't do heroin. Don't do right. heroin. If you, this right. is a bad time to pick up a habit. Right. Uh, right. But Brad, I think he did a fantastic job. And Thanks, what's her man. what's her her legacy now? Uh, she she clearly is a uh, you know has a bit of an upswing. People yes. have recognized yeah. her work posthumously and everything yeah i think there's um there's since new york review of books republished this machines in the head um uh and 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 you know for people who don't know new york review of books is a kind of a chic publisher at the moment they publish really handsome volumes and they tend to do things that have been somewhat overlooked um and, you know, everything I've, I've probably read seven or eight books out of that publishing house now, and they've all been just bangers as the kids, as the kids Dynamite. say. Dynamite. Yeah. All so, right. So I think, I think that's going to lead to a little bit of a resurrection, you know. Um, and our podcast. I mean, she's going to get the uh, Art of gonna... Darkness bump <laughs> big time. Right. Yeah, that's right. And, and there's a, you know, there's an Annika Vaughn Society okay. now that's, that's starting to like put together events and that sort of thing. And, 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 you know. There, with all of the talk about sort of, um, you know, the need for 
to pay attention to voices that have kind of gone unheard. I mean, what yeah. better voice than this sort of masterful writer writing these strange genre bending stuff 70 years ago or incredible 70 60 years yeah. ago or whatever who was a woman An you know independent um, woman independent yeah. woman so like there's i think there's a lot i think there's a lot she can contribute to the sort of 21st 20th 21st century canon as it mm. were so yeah i'm well, looking the, the, forward to seeing more stuff pop up about her for the sure the passages you recited were amazing the, that novel ice sounds fantastic yeah, um it's quite good yeah it's one of those every once it's in apocalyptic, a while apocalyptic yeah but see she thing. does one of the favorite things that i like i like to see in sort of quasi sci-fi stuff which is i like it when the one thing that turns me off about sci-fi and makes me feel like it's an airport thriller is when the characters know exactly what's going on mm. right when the character is like the scientist who happens to do the thing <laughs> yeah right? yeah that, that's right? like that's like the play where it's the journalist is 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 on his way to discover the truth it's right just like, oh, right god i'm gonna hate like, this i just yeah i'm, I'm more interested this. in like the thing is happening in the world and then there's like this forklift operator or yeah. something and like, yeah and right and what is it like for them to try right. and figure out what, what well the nobody has any damned idea what's going on anyway it's, so it's exactly. not realistic to sort of right yeah. Yeah. right it's much more realistic to me to have it sort of happening and <laughs> people are reacting to it as time goes yeah. on yeah. and one thing is like they they talk she talks about in that in, in ice is the main character knows that everything they're being told is propaganda but there's no there's no other information yeah. Right. So you right. don't have anything else. All you have is propaganda that you know is lies. Right. That's that's not relatable at all. Right. Is it? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, well, you know, you mentioned the the Kavan Society, and it, you know, it makes me wonder, what, like, what her what is her Bloomsday going to look like? Is it like right. you you know you wander around London, you go to the Freud Museum, <laughs> you know, you kind of cry, and then you go home and you shoot up. That's that's the Kavan. <laughs> You do that on her, yeah, on right. the, 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 you know, the, the memorial of one of her suicide attempts or whatever. Right, right. Oh, uh, man. man. Something like no, that. No, what a great subject to pick. And I, I you know, I think uh, both of those books that you, you mentioned sound really, really fascinating yeah, and good. They're, they're, they're worth reading yeah. for sure, man. The, the bit about the tigers uh, padding around, it, yeah. it feels like a very interesting description of, like, anxiety in the night. Yeah, and, yeah. And feeling yeah, she's, uneasy. She, yeah. She's very good at, like, she does these things, and I feel like Kafka of as much the same way where it's like it verges on the allegorical but mm. the the thing is it doesn't the allegory doesn't quite stick because it's too sli it's too slippery mm. it's you can't quite just translate it into what you know into one into one thing you know Jung said that basically a, if if you could actually say exactly what a symbol meant, it's not really a symbol anymore. Uh -huh. It's like a sign now, right? right? So she what she's doing is symbolic in like the proper sense, where it's like it clearly stands for something, but the thing it stands for is so complicated, there's no other way to talk about it. And you're going to read into it. So I bet, right. I bet her novels, you could read multiple times at multiple points in your life oh, and yeah. come away. I love that. Uh, yeah. Brad, what is, what is Anna Kavan doing now if she has to endure uh, 2021? Oh, uh, man. What is she you doing know, right now? That's a good question. Heroin. You know, she, well, yeah, probably. She yeah. probably got access to all kinds of, well, I don't know, right? It's, yeah. it's sort of harder and it would, it's, you can't get it the way she used to get it. So, mm. you know, what kind of lifestyle does that lead to? Yeah. I mean, I think she would be writing. I feel like she is um, one of these people who can't really couldn't really do anything else i don't know if she could have fit into the world in any other way so she probably be you know writing some novels that absolutely no one would be paying attention to yeah she doesn't strike me as somebody who's really busy on twitter no. uh, wasting her time there like like we do uh to yeah. that to that end we're both very <laughs> online brad is yeah. on twitter at yeah. Brad Kelly. That's me. I'm on Twitter at Kevin Couchman, and the podcast is on Twitter at Art of Dark Pod. And I'm really excited because on the next episode, I get to talk about George Ivanovich Gurdjieff. Oh, yeah. That's his, uh, his middle name. I'm, uh, I'm the, looking forward to that. That is yeah. a guy. Uh, you, far out, baby. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're that going is all the be way. We're going to get. Gonna, they yeah. don't get any further out than that. You don't guy, get do any further out than the dude who wrote the, you know, Bezelbub's Tales to his grandson and talked about right. the sacred law of Heptaparaparshanak. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be totally a trip, man. I'm crazy. looking forward to that. Kind of roughly yeah. the same period as Escobar. Yeah. A little older, but kind of, you know, I think he was maybe a little older than her, but um, hmm. it's going to be a lot of fun to do that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, do you have an sure. idea of what's next for you, Brad? Have you thought about it? <sighs> I haven't. 
All right. I, I haven't. I, I was right. briefly thinking about Stanley Kubrick. Oh, yeah. But, um, I would. Ooh, okay. Yeah, all right. I, you might be better for that than me, actually. Mm, so. Maybe. Yeah. Well, you know what? Yeah. We'll figure it out. And, uh, yeah. you know, you can just stay tuned. You find us where, wherever you find your podcasts. Yeah. And uh, if, you're, you, Spotify, are, yep. if you are listening to this and you are on Twitter, throw us some ideas, you know? Yeah. Who do you want to hear? Yeah. yeah. And th- this is a podcast about the dark side of artists. It's Art of Darkness, artofdarkpod.com. I'm Kevin Kautzman. Brad Kelly, you did an awesome job. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. That All right. Fun. Okay, buddy. All right. All right. Talk to you next time. Yep. Bye.